every television fan gets used to the pain of seeing their favorite series canceled. Sometimes, though, the plug gets pulled for reasons that were totally avoidable. And sometimes even downright dumb. The 60s Batman series starring Adam West isn't anyone's idea of hard-hitting superhero entertainment. But it's a campy classic, and one that might have stayed on the air longer than two years if the network hadn't gotten a destructive itch. Execs at ABC weren't willing to continue funding Batman after its first two seasons, so they decided to sell the rights to NBC. Meanwhile, NBC wanted to make sure Batman's existing sets and props were part of the deal. Unfortunately, during a brief production hiatus between networks, an ABC exec had the sets destroyed, the deal died, and the caped crusader hung up his cowl. Jonas Armstrong, star of BBC One's Robin Hood, decided to vacate the lead role after the show's third season. But instead of recasting the part with a new actor, the producers opted to simply kill off the character. Since they'd already killed off Robin's love, Maid Marian, that left the supporting cast to carry the show. You know, the one named after a guy who was dead. Although Robin Hood's writing staff was willing to try a revamp, the network decided there was no point in continuing. When Warner Brothers hit pay dirt with Young Justice, which posted triple-digit ratings increases for its time slot on Cartoon Network, it seemed safe to assume they'd want more than two seasons. But the show was axed after only 46 episodes, prompting outcry and widespread speculation. Despite great ratings, the real reason it was canceled was frustrating to its fans. Funding for the show came from a merchandising tie-in deal for Young Justice action figures from Mattel. But when low sales killed the toy line, the show quickly followed suit. It's unfair when a show that's supposed to be a 30-minute toy commercial is actually pretty great. But the toys aren't. Few places are scarier than hospitals. So when horror maestro Stephen King made a deal with ABC to write and produce the haunted medical drama Kingdom Hospital, it seemed like a perfect fit. Sadly, the show's sole season was kind of a mess. Not on screen, where it offered a solid batch of episodes that earned two Emmy nominations, but behind the scenes, where struggles between King and the network doomed it. Convinced ABC wasn't promoting Kingdom Hospital enough, King paid for a print ad campaign, only to see his efforts foiled when execs moved it to a different time slot. King learned yet again that while ghosts are scary, what's truly terrifying is dealing with network executives. After Buffy the Vampire Slayer ended in 2003, fans flocked to the show's spin-off, Angel, which was entering its fifth season. After years on the renewal bubble, Angel enjoyed a post-Buffy ratings bump. Series creator Joss Whedon approached WB Network president Jordan Levin about an early pickup for season six. Although Whedon's move wasn't purely a power play, he was looking for extra security for Angel's team who'd endured years of passing up gigs while waiting for last-minute renewals. Levin saw it as an ultimatum. The president pulled the plug, all for the sake of throwing his weight around. Although the network later admitted it was a mistake, it was too late to revive Angel. Lots of movies are made out of TV shows, but the three Naked Gun movies probably mark the first time a successful series of films respond from an incredibly unpopular TV show. Nice beaver. Thank you. I just had it stuffed. Let me help you with that. Filled with sight gags and recurring jokes, Police Squad, starring Leslie Nielsen as Lieutenant Frank Dreben, hit the airwaves in 1982 and was pulled after just four episodes, with the remaining two burned off over the summer. ABC president Tony Tomopoulos was surprisingly frank about why people weren't tuning in. He told a reporter that the viewer had to watch it to appreciate it. That's right. Police Squad asked that its audience try that crazy thing where they pay attention to what's happening on the screen. Apparently, the jokes on ABC's hit shows Happy Days and The Love Boat were so simple they could be understood by osmosis. Pulling in roughly 3 to 5 million viewers per week, Longmire was A&E's most-watched original drama ever and was among the top-rated dramas on cable TV during its three-season run. Yet the network canceled it anyway. Why? Because most of those fans were too damn old. Yes, T 
TV networks are pretty much only interested in courting the key 18 to 49 demographic, which advertisers think is the easiest group to part from their money. So because Longmire's audience wasn't gullible enough, A&E canceled it. No worries, though. The show was picked up by Netflix, which doesn't have to worry about advertising trends. During the 1969-1970 TV season, CBS chief of programming, Fred Silverman, noticed that the shows getting the best advertising rates were ABC and NBC shows aimed at young and hip viewers, with multicultural casts in urban environments. CBS's shows, on the other hand, were mostly rural family shows. Silverman's solution cancel all his farm shows and replace them with cutting-edge new city sitcoms. Out went The Red Skelton Show, Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, Lassie, and The Jim Neighbors Hour. Replacing them? Honest-to-goodness classics, including The Mary Tyler Moore Show, All in the Family, Good Times, Maud, and The Bob Newhart Show. Ratings surged among younger demographics, and Silverman's move became Hollywood legend, known ever after as the Great Rural Purge. For 26 years, LeVar Burton's beloved Reading Rainbow helped kids develop a love of reading. But in 2009, budget restrictions forced the show's cancellation because it wasn't educating kids in a government-approved fashion. Weird, right? Well, it all started with the No Child Left Behind Act. Signed into law in 2002, it sought to establish new educational benchmarks for American kids, many of which would be measured with standardized test results. In that box is the bill. I don't intend to read it all. That's fine for quantifiable skills, but it's hard to measure love of reading on a standardized test. So there went the funding. The Prime Video series A League of Their Own, based on the 1992 movie of the same name, was set to conclude with a second season only four episodes long, half the length of season one. The short length was odd given that the show's co-creator Will Graham posted on X, formerly Twitter, shortly after the season two announcement that the women's baseball show had more viewers than other series that received full renewals from Amazon. Yet even that abridged ending is no longer happening, with A League of Their Own season two being canceled in August 2023 amidst the WGA and sag after strikes. The official reasoning given for the cancellation was that the strikes would have delayed production in 2024 and the release in 2025, resulting in a three-year gap between seasons. Of course, fans would have been much happier waiting three years for a conclusion than getting none at all. Abby Jacobson, the show's star and other co-creator, wrote on Instagram, to blame this cancellation on the strike, which is an essential fight for fair wages, protections, and working conditions, etc., is cowardly. At the same time Amazon Studios pulled the plug on season two of A League of Their Own, they gave the same treatment to season two of The Peripheral. According to The Hollywood Reporter, some insiders at Amazon believed the sci-fi series, based on the novel by William Gibson, shouldn't have been renewed in the first place. The reason? The original season's $175 million budget was in stark contrast to its lukewarm audience response. However justifiable canceling the peripheral after season one might have been, canceling season two after already greenlighting it was a bad omen for the future of studio talent relations. Not long after the show's cancellation announcement, show producers Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan's development deal with Amazon was suspended. Unlike many canceled shows, the animated fantasy series The Owl House managed to get a satisfying ending, though it was significantly condensed from a full third season to just three hour-long specials. With ratings on par with other ongoing Disney Channel shows and a passionate online fan base, why didn't it get its full three-season run? Creator Dana Terrace said on Reddit that someone at Disney decided the show didn't fit Disney's brand. At the end of the day, there are a few business people who oversee what fits into the Disney brand, and one day, one of those guys decided TOH didn't fit that brand. The story is serialized, our audience skews older, and that just didn't fit this one guy's tastes. Really grinds my guts, boils my brain, kicks my shins, all the things. It sucks, but it is what it is. What exactly about the Owl House was considered un-Disney? 
Terrace initially pushed back against the theory that the show's LGBT plus representation led to the cancellation. But after news of Disney initially donating to politicians backing Florida's Don't Say Gay bill, she was less charitable in her analysis. Cartoon Network's OKKO, OK Let's Be Heroes, also had its third and final season cut short from the original plan for the series. According to creator Ian Jones Corte, the dumb decision that led to the action comedy cartoon's premature ending was not made by the network, but by the former president of the United States. OKKO OK was made with the intention of premiering on a streaming service formed by the merger of Warner Brothers and AT&T, basically what became HBO Max. Jones Corday said in a 2021 interview with Creative Talent Network, Donald Trump specifically hated Warner Brothers because they own CNN, so he wouldn't let that merger go through. Basically, what happened is the studio basically got stuck in a holding pattern while they were waiting for this merger to go through. The president denied the merger. Five simple words that have a really significant meaning. With all the delays in the merger, OKKO OK ended up airing its entire run on Cartoon Network well before the launch of HBO Max. Restrictions on spending during the waiting period for the merger's approval ultimately led to the show's early cancellation and reportedly impacted much of what was being made at Cartoon Network Studios, a studio that no longer exists as an independent entity. The anthology setup of Infinity Train, with each season or book dealing with different characters facing their problems in the same setting, could have theoretically let the show run for, well, infinity. Or at least as long as the writers wanted. Creator Owen Dennis had plans for eight seasons, but ultimately Infinity Train ended after four seasons. The logic behind the cancellation makes little sense, given that Infinity Train was the fourth most streamed HBO Max original of 2020. It also seemed to have been caught up in wildly fluctuating corporate mandates. A Vulture article from May 2022 stated Cartoon Network was seeking out young adult-oriented content, and Infinity Train was perfect for that space. Just three months after that article, the mandate seemingly shifted again, with HBO Max deleting Infinity Train and 35 other mostly animated series. A move Dennis wrote on Substack was incredibly unprofessional, rude, and just straight-up slimy. How many TV shows get canceled because of protests from people who've never watched them in a country where it's not even airing? This was the strange fate of Clone High, the 2002 MTV cartoon created by Bill Lawrence, Phil Lord, and Christopher Miller. The show's main characters are all teenage clones of famous historical figures. And Gandhi's clone responds to the pressure of living up to one of history's greatest leaders by not even trying, instead behaving as a wacky party animal. Don't get on that plane! Yet! First, take this demo to give to Ashley Angel from O-Town. Ew! Clone High never aired in India, but seeing the character's bio on the MTV website was enough to spark a hunger strike of 150 politicians and the real Gandhi's grandson at the MTV India offices. The show's creators had two possible solutions in response to the controversy. They were willing to continue the show without Gandhi, or they could make a quick adjustment so the Gandhi character was actually a Gary Coleman clone, and then continue as usual. Alas, the Viacom higher-ups rejected both options and canceled the show instead. Two decades later, it returned, Gandhi free, on Max in 2023. The fact that Firefly only lasted one season might very well have contributed to its cult favorite status. Given that some of the planned episode ideas for Firefly Season 2 sound flat-out awful, as well as other serious problems that have come to light regarding creator Joss Whedon, maybe it's for the best that it ended while it was still good. Still, it feels like Firefly was treated unfairly during its run on Fox. From the beginning, the Fox executives disliked that Zoe and Wash were married and had contradictory requests over how dark and violent the show should be. It was scheduled for the Friday night death slot, and hyperactive comedy-centric advertisements didn't match the tone of the show. Perhaps the worst sign of how the show was set up to fail was that the pilot episode was somehow changed to the season finale, and three episodes didn't air on Fox at all. Shiny. Let's be bad guys. An unusually mature, action-oriented standout of the Disney afternoon lineup, Gargoyles 
was popular enough that CEO Michael Eisner asked series creator, Greg Wiseman, about using it as the launching pad for a whole franchise. But ratings in the second season declined, and a toned-down third season made by a different crew for Saturday mornings flat-out flopped. Big ambitions followed by disappointment can be a pretty normal cycle for TV shows. But there's one factor in this decline that makes things weird. The O.J. Simpson trial. The second season of Gargoyles kept getting preempted by O.J. trial coverage on many of the stations that ran the Disney afternoon in syndication. Wiseman told Polygon, Every day it ran, we were being preempted, and in any given city, people were missing episodes of Gargoyles and falling out of the habit of watching it. Gordita Chronicles, a sitcom about a family of Dominican immigrants in 1980s Miami, got universally positive reviews and was building word of mouth on HBO Max in the summer of 2022, only to get canceled a little over a month after its premiere. It was later removed from the streaming service entirely. HBO Max's official statement on the cancellation read in part, Live action kids and family programming will not be part of our programming focus in the immediate future. And as a result, we've had to make the very difficult decision to end Gordita Chronicles at HBO Max. A year later, HBO Max rebranded to just Max in hopes of appealing more to family audiences, and it seems like Gordita Chronicles was lost due to some severely confused priorities. Creator Bridget Munez Leibowitz told Rolling Stone, It felt very unjust. It didn't matter that our show was beloved. It didn't matter that we had good audience numbers. It didn't matter that we were writing about content that was important for underrepresented communities. None of that mattered. Warner Brothers Discovery's gutting of TBS and TNT reached its peak on July 11, 2022. That was the day season two of Chad, a comedy starring Saturday Night Live alum, Nassim Pedrod, was supposed to premiere. Only for the show to get canceled and pulled from TBS that very same day. At least the series would eventually be rescued from completely disappearing thanks to the Roku channel. Can you just please find it in your little, little heart to make a special exception just this once? All the corporate statements in the world about how networks celebrate the creators of completed shows they're refusing to air doesn't change just how unfair the whole practice is. Chad was a show that got mostly good reviews from critics and had a strong viewership, but was targeted online with sexist and Islamophobic review bombing, which only served to further embolden online trolls. Ellen DeGeneres may have been in the wrong with how she treated her talk show staff, which led to the end of her talk show, The Ellen DeGeneres Show. But when it came to the end of her 90s sitcom Ellen, it was the ABC executives who were at fault. The star comedian famously came out as gay with season four's groundbreaking two-parter, The Puppy Episode. Has there ever been anyone you felt you clicked with? And what was his name? Susan. In 1997, this was controversial enough that ABC put parental discretion warnings for adult content over many episodes of season five, a move which upset DeGeneres. Network executives reportedly feuded with DeGeneres over how much gay content to include in season five, which ultimately ended up being the show's final season. While declining ratings might offer a rationalization for the cancellation, battles over just how gay the final season could be look ridiculous in retrospect. With the launch of Disney Plus and the start of Marvel Studios producing its own shows for the new streaming service, the Marvel TV series formerly streaming on Netflix were phased out. But Daredevil, the most consistently popular of the Netflix Marvel shows, will eventually be making its grand return on Disney Plus under the new title, Daredevil Born Again. With the stars of the Netflix show returning, this isn't a reboot so much as a new season of the previous series. But former Daredevil showrunner Stephen D. Knight says the name change is simply a ploy to pay the crew at the rate of a show's first season rather than its fourth. He wrote on X, it's an old Disney scam where they slightly rename a series to reset contract terms back to first season. Needs to be addressed by all the guilds, unions, and crushed. The first time The Critic was canceled in 1994, it made sense. Scheduled after home improvement on ABC, it completely alienated the audience, and ratings declined dramatically week after week. Despite this initial failure, The Critic got a second chance on Fox the following year, where it aired after The Simpsons, 
and retained a much higher percentage of its lead-ins audience, showing a lot of growth. You must build from a foundation of trust and understanding. If that doesn't work, tell her you have a tumor. Either way, the key word is growth. The Critic ended up as one of the more watched shows on Fox that year, but it was canceled anyway. Why? Co-creator Mike Reese said that the president of Fox at the time, John Matoyan, just hated the show. Reese told Cracked, One day, he called us in for a meeting with the Fox brass and said, I want to play an episode of your show, and I want you to tell me what's funny. He put the show on, and it started playing, and all the younger executives were laughing. Reese explained that even though the young executives knew they weren't supposed to laugh, they couldn't help it. They were supposed to not laugh and make the boss happy, but they were cracking up. John Matoyan turned around and went, Why are you laughing? Matoyan had the last laugh, though, axing the show. This magazine says Jay's the wittiest man alive, so I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Watch Jay for a month, you don't laugh, I pay you a hundred bucks. When a show gets retooled so heavily that the writers state their disdain for making it in the theme song, it's fair to assume it's not long for this world. Such is the case with Pinky, Elmira, and the Brain. The spin-off slash sequel to Pinky and the Brain, where the lab mice were no longer plotting world domination at Acme Labs, but instead living with the animal-abusing Tiny Toon Adventures character Elmira Duff. The WB didn't know what to do with Pinky and the Brain, a cartoon more intellectual and adult-skewing than they wished their Saturday morning block to be, but also failed to become the next Simpsons in prime time likely because it was scheduled up against the long-running TV staple 60 Minutes on Sundays at 7 p.m. According to Uprox, network executives thought the show needed a broader cast of characters. After three seasons of the classic world domination themes, the network got its way, and nobody liked it, effectively killing both Pinky and the Brain and Steven Spielberg's long run of collaborations with Warner Brothers Animation, despite their best laid plans. What are we gonna do tomorrow night? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world! Advertising for the 2010 FX series Terriers heavily featured angry dogs and the show's logo, which is based around a dog bone. So what's the show actually about? You guessed it, it's a buddy detective show. FX president John Landgraf attempted to downplay the impact bad marketing had on the critical favorite's low ratings and ultimate cancellation. In talking with the Los Angeles Times, he argued that the show was just too subtle for the wider public to appreciate, and that no amount of marketing could have helped it. Some 13 years later, however, producer Sean Ryan still maintains that a vague title and bad marketing sealed the show's fate, not its subtlety. He told The Hollywood Reporter, I blame myself for not pushing better for a better title, and I think FX would admit that they never got the marketing right on that show. There were an astounding 19 shows canceled by the CW in 2022 and 2023, including hits like Riverdale, Nancy Drew, The Flash, The 4400, and more. In fact, almost the entire network lineup was nuked from orbit. Why this extreme house clearing? In 2022, the majority of shares in the CW were sold from previous co-owners, Paramount Global and Warner Brothers Discovery, to Nexstar Media Group which canceled everything in an attempt to boost profitability. There's a lot of dumb to go around here. For example, the fact that the previous owners were reportedly running a major network for 15 years without being profitable, which is either bad business or extremely sketchy Hollywood accounting. There's also the dumb in retrospect decision not to renew the CW's lucrative deal with Netflix in 2019. But now Nexstar is bringing in a different sort of dumb, as they've gutted the network to put out more generic reality shows instead. HBO's dazzling Western series Deadwood ended abruptly after three seasons in 2006. The network wanted the show to return, offering creator and showrunner David Milch a fourth season, but a shortened one. Milch wanted more, however, and rather than taking an abbreviated fourth season, he told HBO, no thanks, and Deadwood was canceled. Milch's impulsive decision and the HBO executive's willingness to go along with it took the rest of the show's cast and crew by shock. It marked a rare, premature cancellation in an era where HBO had a positive reputation for letting shows with low ratings but critical acclaim reach natural conclusions. Eventually, 
Deadwood did get a proper finale, though it was much shorter than even the abbreviated fourth season would have been. Deadwood the movie aired on HBO in 2019, reuniting the majority of the show's cast and earning near-universal positive reviews. In 2009, Chicago-based WGN was rebranded as WGN America, a general interest station in the mold of USA or TNT, and began producing high-quality scripted dramas. This collection included Underground, which was centered around the Underground Railroad, the 19th century network of abolitionists that helped slaves escape the South. Underground brought critical acclaim and some of the best ratings WGN America had ever seen. Despite its success, though, it was canceled in 2017 after two seasons. Peter Kern, president and CEO of WGN America, corporate parent, Tribune Media, said the show didn't fit with the network's new direction. That new direction? No more scripted original series at all. WGN America also scrapped the Appalachian drama Outsiders. When that series got the axe, Kern said the network would be reallocating their resources at the behest of executives at Sinclair Broadcast Group, which was in the process of acquiring WGN America and all of Tribune. The reason was money. Sinclair was interested in making profits, not good TV. Sinclair CEO Chris Ripley told The Wall Street Journal, the channel could be run much more profitably on a fraction of what they spend on programming. In other words, Underground and Outsiders, which cost a reported $5 million an episode, were too expensive. Among the most beloved cult TV shows of all time, Freaks and Geeks aired on NBC during the 1999 to 2000 season. For the dramedy set in 1980, Judd Apatow and Paul Feig pulled from their own awkward upbringings to create a show that was emotionally honest and highly relatable. Freaks and Geeks was never a ratings hit, and NBC canceled it after 12 episodes. The executive who actually pulled the trigger, Garth Ansier, visited the set of Saturday Night Live in 2014, during a week when Geeks cast member Seth Rogen just happened to be there. Rogen later discussed the encounter on HuffPost Live in 2014, saying he and Ansier talked about the premature cancellation. According to Rogan, Ansier said that Apatow refused to listen to his suggestions to make the show better. Ansier's biggest note, he wanted the characters to get more wins and stop being such big losers all the time. In other words, he wanted Apatow to abandon the very essence of the show's premise. Apatow refused, ratings didn't improve, and the network pulled the plug. Fortunately, that freed up a stellar cast of future stars that included Rogan, James Franco, Jason Segel, Linda Cardellini, and many more. The Spiderwick Chronicles is a popular children's book series that was adapted into a popular 2008 feature film. So the six-episode Disney Plus miniseries adaptation seemed on solid ground, until the network canceled it after it was done filming, but before it ever aired. It's particularly heartbreaking to think about this from the perspective of the show's young stars, Lion Daniels and Noah Cottrell. Imagine being a kid and spending nearly five months of your life on a big fantasy series based on a beloved story that will likely set you on the path to achieving your acting dreams. Then, you find out Disney wants to tax break, and it's possible no one will ever see it. Making matters more frustrating, Cottrell has already lived through a similar version of this disappointment, thanks to HBO Max's treatment of Gordita Chronicles.